Welcome to the WWE Podcast, your number one source for the latest in WWE news and straightforward analysis. Are you ready to get this thing going? Give me a hell yeah! I said give me a hell yeah! Then let's get this show started right now. What's going on, everybody? Michael Ritter here. You can find me on Twitter at Michael5Ritter and on Instagram at MichaelRitter5. Today, we are going to be covering the best damn wrestling show going right now on a weekly basis. That's right, Friday Night Smack Down, according to my boy Pat McAfee. But yeah, that's what we're going to be doing here. This episode was aired on July 23rd, 2021, and it took place in Cleveland, Ohio. Man, it feels good to be able to say that. I've honestly been looking forward to that. Not just saying what day the SmackDown was recorded on, but the actual place that it took place in. You know, the city, that's that's always fun. Last week was kind of different. As you guys know, I, was, I did my SmackDown review with Matt. We did a little bit of a live coverage, on-site coverage of the SmackDown that was in Houston. So, I was... Uh, I was in my hotel room, I didn't have my mic, didn't have my computer, didn't have anything like I normally do, you guys could probably tell, and you could also probably tell that I was extremely like congested, I'm actually just getting over a little bit of a sickness, but don't worry guys, it's not COVID or anything like that, believe it or not, people can still get regular sick, so I don't know exactly what it was, but my voice was definitely, um, definitely paying for it while we were recording, and just, you know, the flight home, and Man, like, you guys know whenever you fly, I'm not sure how many of you guys have actually flown in an airplane before, but if you do, your ears usually pop once you hit a certain alti- like altitude or when the plane's taking off or landing. I mean, it's a normal thing. Your ears pop. But I was so congested, like, through my nasal system, whatever. I don't really know exactly all that stuff, what it's called. I'm not a doctor or anything like that. But I was really congested, and it was very obvious. So that affected my ears popping, like, pretty bad. Like, it wasn't, like, super, super painful or anything like that. I mean, it was, like, irritating. I mean, if you know that feeling that your ears won't pop, it's not fun at all. But my flight landed at 8 p.m., and my ears still didn't pop for, like, the next day. Like, it was, like, well over 24 hours that I was dealing with this stuff. But they did eventually pop, and everything was good to go. The flight was not too bad, the the airport process, I mean, you guys know how big of a pain in the rear that is, but it was definitely worth it, whenever you consider everything that happened in Houston, it was a fun show, I definitely enjoyed getting to be there for you guys and provide that live correspondent type feel, I guess you can say, it was definitely, you know, it was was a fun experience, it really was, and all the pops that happened just for the, the, I mean, there really weren't that many returns, Finn Balor is probably the only return that I would consider legit because obviously you guys already know how it happened. John Cena didn't come back until a couple days later at Money in the Bank. But the edge pop, man, that that would have been loud in any arena. It was it was insane. And actually getting to be a part of it, because, I mean, we, we were waiting. Everybody else had already entered the ring, and we knew that he was the last person that had to come out. And there was just that five to six seconds of anticipation where it was just building up. And he finally, his music hit, and, man, the crowd just lost it. And it was definitely cool to be a part of that, so... The whole show was nice. I definitely, if it's convenient for you, you know, geographically and financially, then definitely, I mean, I would recommend going to a show. It's fun. I mean, just being a part of that atmosphere and uh, feeling that energy, you could just, you could literally feel it before the show started when you knew, I mean, more lights were starting to come on, seats were starting to get filled up, people, you, you could feel their excitement next to you and it gets you more excited and everybody's kind of just talking about it and you know how special of a moment it was that it was the very first show in front of fans but I think that no matter where you are I think that even even if it's just a live event you know a house show I think that um that you'll be glad that you did I mean well it has to make sense obviously like I mentioned a little bit earlier I mean financially you know you don't want to break yourself by flying across the country just to go to a WWE show but I mean if it's close to you and you know you can get a nice ticket for a decent price I definitely would recommend going to a show but anyways the smackdown that aired last night july 23rd 2021 i think that it was another good episode of smackdown i mean there was five five wrestling matches albeit two of them were at rolling lod according to bat mcafee that was a that was a pretty fun little 
little segment, I guess you can say, just seeing him and Michael Cole's reaction to all of that. I mean, the crowd there at Rolling Loud was a little bit different. I mean, you could tell they really weren't invested. I mean, it's not like it just blindsided them. I guarantee that whenever they bought their tickets, looking at the event, it said that there was going to be, like, wrestling there. You know, I'm sure that it was advertised and promoted. I mean, I personally don't know. I don't keep up with Rolling Loud, but I just assume that they knew. And just given the type of people who were probably there, they were likely wrestling fans at some point in their life. I mean, at least some of them. I guarantee there were some people in that crowd who were WWE fans when they were younger. And they probably just grew up or whatever, and now they're more concerned with concerned with literally Rolling Loud that they probably just don't have time to really uh, get invested in wrestling. And, you know, that's all right. You know, it's kind of that, that age group where, you know, re- watching wrestling isn't necessarily the coolest thing in the world, I guess you can say, to some people. But I don't know. I, I feel like the matches that they had um, kind of blended in well with the show, I guess you can say. And, I mean, and I wasn't there, obviously, so I can't speak on how the crowd actually reacted. But, I mean, they looked like they were dead. Like, they're, you've seen a couple hands go up here and there. But... Other than that, they weren't, I mean, they didn't really pop for anything. I mean, you heard them say, ooh, or something like that. You know, react to a move every now and then. I mean, if they see a power bomb, you know, I mean, a, somebody who's never seen wrestling before in their life, you see somebody get power bombed on the mat, you're going to know that, I mean, it's going to make you feel some type of emotion, you know. So I guess that was pretty cool, just seeing wrestling at a different venue like that, you know, outdoors in Miami. I, I thought that was pretty cool. But like I said, there were five matches. We also get a John Cena promo and an Edge promo. I mean, Think about that. John Cena and Edge both got mic time on one two-hour show. I mean, mic drop right there, you know. I mean, and we got some developmental storylines with Edge and Seth Rollins. And then Tony Storm obviously made her debut. So, I mean, this was a jam-packed episode of SmackDown. And I was definitely excited to get on here and cover it for you guys. But I guess we can start from the very top here on this SmackDown And it started with John Cena, kind of similar to how Monday Night Raw started a few days earlier. John Cena comes to the ring, and he officially makes his challenge to Roman Reigns for the Universal Championship at SummerSlam. Roman would eventually reject his challenge a little bit later in the night, but this is where the groundwork was set. You know, they kind of planted, the shovel made its first dig in the ground where a match was actually mentioned. And John Cena said how basically, yeah, I want to get this, I want to become the 17th time champion and he can do that at SummerSlam if he were to beat Roman Reigns but obviously Roman Reigns rejected but we do get a little bit of some good mic work from John Cena working with the crowd a little bit and then Paul Heyman eventually comes out and basically says that Roman will announce on his time or he'll he'll answer his challenge on his time and then kind of mocks his theme song like everybody's done at some point in their life it was just kind of funny to hear Paul Heyman actually do it in the mic, and you know the crowd was actually loving that. Like being there live for that probably would have gotten a pretty huge pop, but that's how the show started was with John Cena cutting a promo and basically letting us know, I mean, hey, it's official. He wants that Universal Championship. We all knew it was going to happen, but hearing it from John Cena's mouth and saying that that's basically why he came back, it kind of just, you know, it really hit it home. So I'm very excited for these next few weeks. Roman Reigns, he clearly has to step up on the mic, and you saw that. He does cut a promo a little bit later in the show where he does his uh, famous missionary position line that he said. But you can just tell that Roman Reigns knows that he has to take it up uh, another level, I guess, is one way to put it, because he's not going up against Cesaro here on the mic. He's not going up against Daniel I mean, even Daniel Bryan's a hell of a, a promo, He's not going up against Daniel Bryan. This is John Cena we're talking about here. Literally the best uh, promo in the entire WWE's history, in my opinion. That's my honest opinion. I mean, John Cena carved up The Rock, if you guys remember correctly. John Cena was absolutely just, I mean, and people consider The Rock one of the best promos of all time. John Cena knows how to take it to another level whenever you're talking about mic work. So, Paul Heyman and John Cena going back and forth for the next few weeks. That is going to be absolute money. And, man, I'm so glad that that, uh, that program's on SmackDown. But up next we get a match, Finn Balor and Sami Zayn. It was basically the match version of their encounter last week that they had in Houston where Sami Zayn went out to the ring and was basically complaining to the crowd. He did the exact same thing tonight. But Finn Balor came out last week and made his return and hit the coup de grace on him. Well, that's exactly what happened this time, except it was under an official match format. So, 
Sami Zayn actually lost after receiving the coup de grace. Finn Balor gets a win. He's 1-0 on SmackDown. I'm going to keep track of this because every single time I see Finn Balor on my TV, especially here tonight, but last week, I was even telling my roommate about it through the week. I was like, man, I would get so behind a Finn Balor push. And I think that that's what they're going to do here. I mean, he obviously he comes out later on in the night whenever Roman Reigns goes out to reject Edge's challenge. Finn Balor goes out there and says, hey, if you're going to uh, say no to Edge, what about my challenge? And Roman Reigns accepts his. But if you guys remember, Finn Balor's first night on Raw, I'm pretty sure he beat Roman Reigns. I mean, I know for sure he got the better of him at some point. I don't know I don't know if it was an official match, but I do think it was. And Finn Balor was just robbed of that Universal Championship run. The fact that he got injured and they just forgot about him and just basically threw him to the side. And he never really got another opportunity at that championship. I feel like that was just criminal. I mean, because that was right when the brand split was happening. Finn Balor was a very high pick for Monday Night Raw. I remember that kind of, you know, it... Um, it caught me off guard because I really didn't pay attention to NXT at the time. And I knew who Finn Balor was, but I didn't expect him to be viewed that highly on the main roster. And they were pushing him to the moon his first night. So I do really wonder. I don't know if Matt and Anthony DeMarco have done a what if on that. But man, they should do a what if Finn Balor never got injured. That I feel like that would be a, that would be a good one. I'm probably going probably gonna to suggest that to him at some point. Maybe in the mailbag or something like that. But Finn Balor gets the win, so he's already starting 1-0. He goes out there and challenges Roman Reigns a little bit later. So you can expect to see a lot of Finn Balor here going forward on SmackDown, and I am extremely happy about that. But moving on here, Big E, he cuts an in-ring promo to address his Money in the Bank win on Sunday. But he gets interrupted by Apollo Crews and Bobby Roode and Dolph Ziggler. And then Shinsuke and Cesaro come out, and it ends up basically hell breaking loose and Cesaro ends up putting Apollo Crews on the swing so I do think that we're going to see Cesaro go at Apollo Crews and possibly take that Intercontinental Championship maybe I I don't know for sure if I would put money on that but I mean I was kind of talking about it with Matt on the last Smackdown review a way to get Otis involved would be to get the championship off of Apollo Crews because you can have Otis chase a babyface champion so if Cesaro was that guy to beat Apollo Crews, which, I mean, Apollo Crews has had that championship for a while now. I mean, he won it at WrestleMania, I think, or maybe around that time because he took it from Big E. So let's see. I, I mean, I, I would like to see Cesaro take it from him and then maybe get Otis chasing Cesaro. That's kind of, you know, maybe getting a couple steps ahead here, but I think that's definitely a direction they can go. But speaking of Otis, we do get our Rolling Loud matches here next back-to-back, so they kind of just keep us there for a little bit, and the first one was Angelo Dawkins versus Chad Gable. He gets a little bit of retribution for everything that's happened over the past few weeks, given that, I mean, he was attacked backstage whenever Otis first made his heel turn, and then he had a match against Chad Gable the week later, and Otis attacked him from the outside of the ring, and then he actually got that one-on-one match with Otis, eventually got squashed, so he does get a one-on-one match here with Chad Gable, and... Let's see. He does. I mean, he wins after a pop-up spine buster. So he got the he got the win there at Rolling Loud. And I feel like the Street Profits probably got the best reaction. Maybe them. I'm not sure if Bianca got a bigger one. But I know for sure that uh, the Street Profits, they were out there with Wale. They're kind of, they had the biggest entrance out of everybody. So I do feel like they probably got a little bit more of a warm welcome there from the crowd in Miami. But I do think that this was a, it was kind of funny, I, I will say, because they were showing everything that was happening there at Rolling Loud. And Pat McAfee said, do we have boots on the ground at Rolling Loud? And Michael Cole was like, uh, yeah, Pat, we have a whole production team. How do you think you're getting the TV broadcast? I, I just thought that was funny. I don't know if that was actually supposed to be said or if that was Michael Cole just actually saying, yes, you doofus, what do you think? Like, It was just a funny, uh, funny little segment there, and I definitely wanted to mention that here on the show. But the next match we get at Rolling Loud was – the women's championship match. So they did get a championship match there rolling out, although it did feel like the matches that they put on there were more so like live events. You know, and I know I like to make that comparison a lot because I've been to a lot of them. And it's basically whenever you know or the, the, the winner of the match, like if it's a grudge match like Angelo Dawkins and Chad Gable, it really doesn't matter who wins. I mean, it, it sucks to say, yeah, it matters storyline-wise, but... You can have either guy go over and it's not going to make a difference, you know. But if you cannot do that thing or that same thing with a championship match, like anytime there's a championship match at a live event, 
you know for a fact that the champion is going to win. There's no way in hell that here in Amarillo, Texas, they're going to make Carmella defeat Bianca Belair, you know, just for example. So I know anytime I go to a live event here in my hometown, I know no championships are going to switch hands, and rightfully so. You shouldn't expect that, but that's kind of how I felt like rolling loud. I didn't expect Carmella to have a chance here, and it wasn't just because, I mean, Bianca Belair is, in my opinion, a lot better than her, but it was just because of where they were. I feel like that kind of, if anything, it took me a little bit out of the the moment there, just as far as that storyline goes, because Carmella got that championship match, and I'm not really sure why either. I mean, Bianca Belair has handled Carmella pretty, uh, pretty easily, I guess you can say, during this entire program, so I guess... Uh, I guess Carmella's still going to be the one she goes against until somebody returns or maybe one of the new call-ups get a shot at Bianca Belair. Maybe they do some type of tournament because I noticed that SmackDown is getting a lot of young talent here over the last few weeks, and we'll see another one a little bit later in the show, but Bianca does win with a kiss of death, so this was a nice little visual for the crowd. They had some fireworks and stuff like that. I mean, it was a, it was a nice, little, nice little moment there, and maybe somebody left that Rolling Loud arena or the crowd there and said, you know, I'm going to actually pay attention to this stuff going forward because it might have been, you know, they might have enjoyed what they saw there. But let's see here. Continuing on, Baron Corbin, he actually apologized to Kevin Owens uh, for everything that he's done in the past, I guess. And I guess Kevin Owens starts to buy into his sob story because he actually reaches into his wallet and hands him like 60 bucks. I mean, he hands him some cash. I don't know exactly how much it was. But he, you can tell he starts to feel bad for him, and he kind of just hands him some money to help him out just a little bit. And Shotzi Blackheart and Tegan Knox are kind of standing over there to the side on Shotzi's uh, tank, and they kind of look like they're messing with it a little bit. But you know how they can, like, shoot a T-shirt out of that tank? Well, they had that pointed exactly at Baron Corbin's groin, and... They pulled the trigger, I guess you can say, and yeah, you can imagine what happened there. So hit Baron Corbin right in the nuts, and he drops to the ground. Right in time for Robert Roode and Dolph Ziggler to walk up and point and laugh and steal the money that he just got from uh, Kevin Owens. So I thought that was, man, Baron Corbin. I don't know what he did to get on this. Uh, I don't really know. I mean, He's, it's like he is in hot water. I know he's probably not, and they're just really trying to do a character change with him, but it, I mean, he's getting humiliated on a weekly basis, and he has to hate this. I, I mean, I don't know for sure. He's probably He probably doesn't care what people think about him, but I'm sure, I mean, if this were to end and him actually you know, speed up the process of getting him a new character, I don't think he would complain. One thing that my roommate actually pointed out in this, and I noticed as well, is they're trying to make it seem like he's just so poor and, you know, they'll they'll make his shirt all messed up with his collar halfway popped and just unbuttoned shirt. But if you actually pay attention, that's a literally brand new shirt. Like, literally, you could tell that it's folded out of the package. You could tell he went to Dillard's or something and just got a button-up shirt. So pay attention next time and look at Baron Corbin's shirt. Or if you haven't watched SmackDown yet and you actually tune in, look at Baron Corbin's shirt because it's pretty obvious that the actual shirt is brand new. And they're just trying to make it seem like he's wearing the same shirt over and over again. Moving on here in the show, we get Edge coming to the ring to talk about Seth Rollins interfering in his match at Money in the Bank. And then Seth Rollins eventually comes out. They do have a little bit of an exchange. Seth Rollins does, in my personal opinion, hang with Edge here. I mean, he does go word for word in terms of a mic or a verbal confrontation. You can tell that Edge went for a while and then he gave Seth Rollins his time. And then he went, and I feel like they both actually delivered on their promos. But one thing I know, I mean, they both referenced 2014 and the whole incident where Seth Rollins had his foot on Edge's neck. But for whatever reason, they won't show the highlight. Like, why not? I don't understand that. Is it too graphic? Is it too, is it just something that you don't want to show because it's a a neck thing or a head thing? I, I don't really understand why you won't just show that highlight for anybody who didn't watch. Because, I mean, that was literally seven years ago. There's definitely people who are watching this who didn't get to see that, you know? So I'm like, why wouldn't you show that? I mean, you, you, you literally are showing highlights from, like, 2014, 2015. Like, any time, like, a Royal Rumble is about to come up, every week on Raw, they'll show, like, Royal Rumble highlights, you know? And they'll just randomly pick a, a random year. I mean, I've seen them go back to the 90s and just show highlights from that match. Like, why can you not pull this up from 2014? So that tells me that there's definitely something else there. For whatever reason, they do not want to want to show us that. So, I mean, go look it up on YouTube if you want to see it. 
It's just Edge and Seth Rollins, their actual first confrontation where it was legitimately thought that Edge was done, that he was never going to come back and wrestle in the WWE. So, I mean, it's good stuff. I will say, if you didn't get to see it, I mean, they're going to they're going to continue to reference that in the coming weeks. So, I mean, it would it would be nice to actually be caught up on that, you know, if you haven't got to see it. So, definitely go look that up. But yeah, Edge comes out. They do start to brawl a little bit, even though Edge tells him, "I promise, if you come out here, I won't lay a hand on you." And Edge says, "Hey, you know, I said I wouldn't lay a hand on you." I'm a liar, and they actually just started beating the hell out of him, and they just go back and forth. Um, Edge ended the brawl with an education and was looking for a spear before Rollins rolled out of the ring to escape. That's what they wrote here on the CBS Sports review, so that's kind of what I'm using to track through and navigate this show as far as the order of things. Normally, I'll take notes on my computer, but last night I was kind of just watching SmackDown, and I don't know, it, it, it is kind of easier doing it this way, just looking at the actual order of, I mean, because I do it in chronological order as well, so I mean, I'm doing it, or seeing another website do it like this is pretty cool, but I guess moving on here, we get that debut match from Tony Storm, the most recent call-up and the newest member of SmackDown, and I actually hope and pray that they leave her on SmackDown after this whole shake up or draft or however you want to want to frame it i hope that she remains on smackdown i mean she has a 50 percent chance i guess you can say she's not going back to nxt so she's either going to be on raw or on smackdown either way i'm looking forward to seeing her continue to establish herself she gets the win here on zelina vega after hitting a storm one so zelina's back but she's taken like what three losses if you include the money in the bank as well she lost to Liv morgan and now she's losing to tony storm in her debut match so it's it could already tell you where they have used Zelina as far as in ring, and this is kind of what I referenced whenever, whenever she came back, is that I was never high on her in the ring, on the mic as a manager, up there with the best of them in the business right now, and that, and I mean that she can cut a promo, she can speak, and she makes you feel a certain way any time that she cuts a promo, but as far as in the ring, it's just never really been that believable for me. She's just so small. And that's not the only reason why. I mean, it's just like Charlotte. You know, if, if you if you put Zelina Vega up against Charlotte, that's not going to be believable at all. Rhea Ripley, Nia Jax. And I know that Alexa Bliss isn't uh, isn't that much bigger than Zelina Vega, but Ale- Alexa Bliss was like a wrestler and actually like established in that way for years you know before she actually started dealing with some head injuries or concussions whatever it was that made her actually slow down as far as the in-ring stuff I feel like Zelina Vega being a manager for so long and then just kind of starting to dip her toes and they're actually referencing yeah she's wrestled all around the world like why didn't you tell us this a long time ago why didn't you have her be in the ring with Andrade every time that he was coming out you know you you made her be a manager 98 percent of the time so that's how I view her and you can't just say, all right, well, she's extremely tiny. Now we're going to have her get in the ring and go against these wrestlers who have been literally running ropes and actually wrestling for the past 10 years, you know. So I guess that's the one aspect where I can't just turn my brain off and just get invested into the wrestling character of Zelina Vega. On the mic, 100%, I think that she has a long future. She can get with somebody who can't really speak and just, you know, take him them. I mean, look at Andrade's English wasn't that well. But or he didn't speak English very well, but Zelina Vega does. So she was out there just adding to Andrade's character, and it really didn't. Him not being able to speak to speak English really was never a problem, you know, because it never really came up. She was able to speak for him every time. I feel like somebody. I mean, obviously not Brock Lesnar, but somebody like Brock Lesnar, who is an absolute monster, a force who just doesn't have good mic work. You put Zelina Vega with them, and it could be money. So. Let's see, we got one more match here on the show. Jimmy Uso versus Dominic Mysterio. This match wasn't very long, but Dominic did look pretty good in it, I will say. He's starting to really come together as a wrestler, and it's not like he was bad before, but you can just tell that in comparison to the guys that he was working with, I know Chad Gable was a guy that he's really always had good chemistry with, in my opinion, but I feel like now it's starting to be more consistent with everybody. That Dominic is starting to actually put on some pretty good matches, so I like to see that. Because I've, I've been monitoring his development on SmackDown. Because I've been wondering, since he was with that 
Buddy Murphy program and the whole Mysterio. You guys remember how cringe all that stuff was, but I feel like Dominic was a guy who, if he would have stayed in doing that type of stuff, he wasn't going to last at all. He was never going to get over the fact that now he's just with his dad and they were just the tag team champions. And now you can tell that they're, I mean, they're still working together. He's still getting matches against the Usos. He does have a spot here on SmackDown. So hopefully he'll be able to continue to get better at everything that he's doing inside the ring and maybe get some mic skills because I know that's an area where they're not even, I mean, he has like one line every time he talks. He's never had to cut a promo at all. And that's a problem for me. I need to see what he can do on the mic because that adds so much to the character. It's what's going to separate Dominic Mysterio, the kid, from Dominic Mysterio, the wrestler, you know, because right now I can't really tell the difference between the person and the wrestler. He seems like he's being himself, and that's awesome, but I don't know if himself is going to be a good wrestling character, you know, if if that makes sense. So I do want to see him add a little bit um, in that aspect of his character. But Jimmy wins with a roll-up here. It wasn't any, I mean, it wasn't a very long match, but it wasn't a clean roll-up either. Jey Uso was kind of pushing on Jimmy's backside to secure the pin but I guess um I guess Dominic and Ray because this could have been a spot where they got their rematch clause if there even still is that thing in WWE for the tag team championships that they lost on the pre-show on Money in the Bank so I thought that maybe that they could have gotten this or they could have used this opportunity to get those rematches out of the way but they wanted to go one-on-one so I'm not sure if we're going to see that rematch or not not sure if anybody even really cares because the Usos, they're not going to lose it. I mean, now that they have the gold or all their championships in the official bloodline, you can just expect them to want to keep it like that. I don't think Edge is going to take the title. Or not Edge, John Cena. I don't think John Cena is going to take the title from Roman. I don't think that there's going to be a tag team right now on SmackDown or anywhere else that's going to come and challenge the Usos. I feel like they are literally the best tag team in the WWE right now, and that's just being completely objective. I really believe that. I think that back whenever they were a true tag team, it was something that I could appreciate because there wasn't many of them, and there still isn't a lot of uh, true tag teams, but the Usos are a rare actual tag team, and you know, just given that they're twins, it was probably always known that they were going to be a tag team, even since they were little kids, so that's pretty cool that they're literally just fulfilling the prophecy, I guess you can say, It's, it's pretty cool to see, but... That is SmackDown. It was a, like I said, it was a good episode. Five matches, some promos, story development. It's really all you can ask for. Back in front of crowds, there's really no reason not to love what SmackDown's doing right now. I mean, yeah, you can be down on some stuff, but man, as as a show overall, show me a show that's better than SmackDown. I mean, that's just my personal opinion, man. It's it's a damn good uh damn good two hours spent every week or however long it takes to watch SmackDown. Whether you're fast forwarding, watching on Hulu, it doesn't really matter. As long as you're getting the content and you're actually watching the stuff, I, I definitely know that you're probably enjoying what you're seeing. And the same can't be said for all these other shows that are going on right now. I know that NXT is usually always pretty good. I do watch that whenever I can. Don't really watch AEW, although I am pretty high on some of the wrestlers who are over there. So maybe I'll start tuning into that going forward, especially some of the rumored guys who are going to be going there. I mean, it's going to be hard not to tune in to AEW once they kind of start getting some of these new faces, at least for me. Because I know that some of you probably already do. You've been watching AEW for almost two years now. That's great. That's badass. The more wrestling, the better. I mean, I'm sure that you are a huge fan of that and some of the guys who are over there. And I know a lot of the guys that are over there, actually. You know, Miro, formerly known as Rusev. Obviously, John Moxley. Cody Rhodes. Aleister Black. Isn't Andrade over there as well? Sting, literally one of my favorite wrestlers of all time. So, Definitely, um, Jim Ross. I mean, there's there's stuff to like. Chris Jericho. I mean, AEW is loaded with former WWE guys and some of their own talent. You know, some of the guys who aren't WWE guys. So definitely worth getting over there and checking it out. And of course, Mimi Burst does a great job covering it. So definitely want to check out the AEW review. And I know she has Ashley Mann on as well, who's another longtime co-host here on the show. So there's a lot of content. I also want to quickly say that I think I'm going to be filling in a little bit for Matt. Um, covering Monday Night Raw. You know, he's going to be pretty busy here in the coming weeks. A newborn child is going to be entering their household. So I know that, I mean, I personally don't know. I don't have any kids. But, I mean, if you do have kids out there, I'm sure you know that Matt's going to be pretty busy over the next few weeks. So I'm going to do my part and do what I can to try to make this process, you know, as easy as possible for him just for, you know, as long as he's out. You know, I definitely want to make sure he knows, you know, to take as long as he needs 
I want to make sure that he knows that the show is going to be in good hands. And I just want you, the listeners, you know, to kind of bear with me. You know, I'm, I'm going to do the best I can to cover Monday Night Raw and SmackDown. Just, I mean, because Matt, those are extremely big shoes to fill. I mean, and no, like, that's one thing that I've noted. I mean, Matt, Michael Gross, those dudes are phenomenal wrestling podcasters. They really are. And I know Michael Gross doesn't have his own show, but he easily could. I mean, he is a damn good you know, source of insight, knowledge, just in the wrestling. He's been around for a long time. He's seen a lot of wrestling action. So every time he's on the show, I learn something, and I feel like I become a more knowledgeable wrestling fan and just a wrestling viewer in general. So that's one thing I did want to say is, you know, Matt, that, that, that's like an unfair comparison because he is great at this. He's been doing it for a long time. I'm just going to do my part and do the best I can to try to continue to provide these uh, these episodes for you guys because I know that you look forward to them. I, I do as well. So I want to make sure that you guys aren't missing something whenever you watch Monday Night Raw. And um, just for the, sh- the short time being, while I am that, I guess, quote-unquote, substitute teacher, you guys are going to still get a full Monday Night Raw covered. So that's all I got for you this week. Hope you guys all have a fantastic rest of your weekend. Walk passionately in the direction of your dreams, and I'll talk to you soon.